This is David Hofmeister's Unwind Your Mind Back to God. Read by Tarana Singh. In today's episode, we continue laying the foundation with Book 1. In Chapter 6, this is Section 16. On Private Minds David This coming together and really sharing of the heart is the dispelling of the ego. To the ego, communication is abandonment. Think about close relationships or significant relationships where you thought, I cannot tell him that. If I told him that, he or she would leave me. The whole basis of the ego is that you have a private mind with private thoughts and you have some hideous things in there. Things that if your husband or your best friend or your lover ever knew, they would be gone in an instant. If you ever shared yourself completely. But the desire to communicate attracts communication. As we start to desire to let the Spirit be the guide of our lives, we begin to attract witnesses to the Holy Spirit. We can see the Spirit more and more. You cannot see the Holy Spirit perceptually, but you can see the witnesses to the Holy Spirit in your life. That is how you know that He is there. That is the effect of miracles. It is helpful to always keep that in mind because the temptation when coming together in groups or family is to only go so far with communication. To keep areas of privacy and to not let go of your mind completely. But when you do let go of your mind completely, you spring into the oneness of one mind. Friend A friend was talking earlier about the collective consciousness, the Christ mind consciousness, There are a lot of belief systems that are dealing with the human pool of consciousness, sometimes referred to as the raised mind consciousness. I am thinking of large groups in which there are several specific types of thought manifestations all the way to mass hypnosis, etc. How does the Course deal with this specifically? I have only seen references to individual thought and not collective thought. David To look at this idea of the collective, let's turn to the ego and false autonomy section. Often I hear people talk about there being a difference between dealing with their own ego versus the collective ego. Or I hear comments like, my friend's ego is really acting up. What am I to do since I am doing pretty well at handling mine right now, but my friend is out of control? The first two sentences of the second paragraph are very helpful. Everyone makes an ego or a self for himself, which is subject to enormous variation because of its instability. He also makes an ego for everyone else he perceives, which is equally variable. Text chapter 4, section 2 Oh, Now we are getting past the trick of the collective. You see, that is where the individual mind thing comes in. Jesus is saying that your mind is twisted, 
Not only have you made an ego for yourself, which you might call your personality, but you have made an ego for every other person you meet. It is your dream. You are the dreamer of the dream. You have made this whole thing up. Now that is a huge leap. There is another place in the course where he hints at this with the question. How many teachers of God are needed to save the world? Manual for Teachers, Part 12 When thought of in the collective sense, you might wonder how many thousands it will take to handle this mess. To answer that, Jesus gives is one. It cannot be a collective thing since it takes only one teacher of God to handle this seeming mess of multiplicity. This is pretty deep. It goes back to the idea that there is only one mind. The whole idea of the collective or of multiple minds or even egos is a metaphorical construct that Jesus uses often in the Course. For example, when he talks about your brother's mind or about minds in plural. These are metaphorical constructs. We get a hint that he is using the plural in a metaphorical sense in the clarification of terms section where he talks about mind and spirit. At the bottom of the first paragraph he addresses what you mentioned earlier, the unified spirit. He describes and uses the metaphor of the individual mind as if we each have one. He knows that the mind is so convinced of the illusion that it would make no sense to come right out and describe things in terms of the one mind. The course is written at the ego level, where it is needed. It would do no good to just have two words, God is because the mind is not in touch with God is. It believes in fragmentation and needs a system to help undo that fragmentation. Once again, it is described as if it has two parts. The split mind is a metaphor because in reality, the separation did not happen. Separation must be impossible because God did not create it. But he knows that when the mind is in the deluded state, you have to have something to work with. So, as a structural component or metaphor, it is described as if it is split in two parts, a right mind and a wrong mind. When we get into the belief that the collective is causative in some way, that it influences individuals, this is still part of the ego's backward thinking. It is a big thing to remember that I am responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings I experience and I decide upon the goal I would achieve. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. Text, Chapter 21, Section 2 This does not leave a lot of leeway for projection. If all my feelings and perceptions come from my decision, then I am responsible. That is the good news. That is where the empowerment is. I do not have to rely on anything 
or anyone outside myself to accept the atonement. But I cannot project the responsibility for the ego anywhere else.